Hey, what's going on guys? Come on, KNZ here. In this video, we're going to be considering the next step in building Linux from scratch. So the last video, we've been manually creating the root file system and manually configuring and compiling Tiebox. And, but there is a simpler way, and it's not only simpler, it's also cleaner and better and, like, I don't know, like, less uh, options to make a mistake basically so I'm gonna be doing something similar to what we've been doing in the previous video uh, but instead I'm gonna be relying completely on this MK root uh, MK root by Rob Landley so let's just start with uh, grab, grabbing the code and it consists of the single shell script that actually creates the root file system for you and if you're interested in walking through uh, every single line of code within this file. Uh, I'll give you a link in the description below this video where Rob Landley himself explains everything uh, with a great passion and even greater clarity so you can understand everything, not only how it works, but, uh, but also some historical anecdotes uh, behind some uh, well-known Linux, um, I don't know, not, maybe not configurations, but I don't know, like how the things used to be done. Anyways, um, so I just want to create a new folder here, let's call it Linux, and I just want to grab the kernel from, from the previous part, so just grab the kernel, um, and paste it here, and now um, let's get clone things. So let's say git clone, and here we go. So cd into mk root, and I just run this mk root dot shell. So by the time it's way, uh, by the time it's doing his his job, so. Uh, it's based uh, instead of being based on BusyBox, it's mostly based on Tiebox, which is Rob Landley's uh, work. Let's say that is he was he was maintaining BusyBox, but then he switched to try to Tiebox, which is uh, as he claims somewhat a cleaner implementation. But one of the main reasons for doing this is the license issues, and the Tiebox is being used within the Android, as far as I'm aware from his talk at embedded at embedded Linux conference, where he was presenting his uh, where he was presenting this script we're currently building in particular. So uh, what it does, uh, it creates the root file system. Uh, it merges uh, all those uh, pre-configured packages from Tiebox slash BusyBox. So those are not available in Tiebox are taken from BusyBox. So you have all the basic Linux commands. Uh, it also provides some features to kind of give it uh, to install additional modules. However, I know the script is quite outdated and no longer maintained. So I didn't quite manage to build those scripts. I mean, like. Uh, it just downloads uh, the, the archive, but it doesn't it doesn't automatically extract it and doesn't automatically build it for some reason. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but that doesn't really matter that much because uh, it's not about that basically. So and now we are done, and if we go here to MK root and the output host and root, then here uh, we have uh, we have our root file system and let's have a look at the init so as opposed to the init that we have in the previous video this one is much bigger it also set a, sets up the networking for QEMU so you have like some uh, so if config is actually now showing something if you run it so um, well let's say um, just want to yeah let's just grab I need this command to create the root file system and yeah actually I want to create a root file system here so in the output of this uh, mk root shell script so just paste this in copy and by the way in the video 
he had this thing uh, being bundled in the script, but then for some reason it has disappeared from there. So this root CPIO GZ, J, uh, GZ. Uh, just copy, or I can even cut it. Um, and download, nope. Yeah, and here paste it along near, like near the kernel. And it's already enough to run. So I'm specifying uh, the kernel image, which is BZ image, and this init RD, which, which is root CPIO GZ, the compressed root file system. Okay, so run it in, enter, and now the Linux, the Linux kernel boots. And we're getting into the console, into the shell. All right, so same things here. However, uh, unlike, unlike with the last video, uh, for instance, if we uh, list the devices, it already, it already provides a lot of things. Uh, using some hack that he he, like he can he kind of explains that in great details in the video. Uh, I'll provide them in, in the link in the description below the video uh, below this one. So how exactly this is done? Some sort of a temp file system is used for that. I'm not sure. Just not going to be talking about this. Anyways, um, what else? Interestingly, so if config interface config. So see, like we have this uh, the Ethernet, the local Ethernet. So kind of have have an option to to actually I don't know probably it even can connect to internet at this point I'm not sure I didn't test this but most likely but anyways um, even though it seems uh, quite cool before ending this video um, I want to talk about a few important points uh, that me as the user realized which I didn't realize before uh, and mostly, mostly it regards to the packaging systems. So ju just just to give an idea, even, even though I didn't really actually manage to, to get it work, but uh, well, here in the documentation, he states that you can list uh, you can list this kind of packages that you want to add to this existing distribution. So this didn't work for me, but let's assume it does. Let's assume it does. So just a very quick look. So here we have the modules, and these are the scripts. For instance, this one allows installing, uh, downloading uh, Dropbear. But well, it, it probably should be installing this as well. I don't know. Probably if I, uh, yeah, probably this didn't work for me because I didn't uh, uh, this cross cross compile. Uh, didn't set up the cross compiler. Probably gonna say just. Yeah, it's probably because I didn't set the cross compile. Well, we can actually try this. Um, wondering. So this should probably install this to the root folder. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, I'm just wondering. Yeah, just let's actually have a look because this is something well it, it just doesn't the idea is that if you just do if you do this it just doesn't work it just give you an idea um so we just try to install some packages oh then we can uh no less well of course, of course not mk root but anyways um anyways oh come on um Yeah, so like you see, it says it needs uh, the root folder and the build files. So the way how it's supposed to be done in in this readme file just simply doesn't work. But however, the reason, the way how I managed to to make it uh, is by specifying. So here, here is another option you can specify. So if you just type things like mk root and something he doesn't know about, he tells this. The usage here so you can spe specify the uh, the variables with the values that are used within the script itself so for instance um yeah let's have a look at yeah this uh, the shell script again yeah um 
So this cross compile um, So yeah, which goes cross compile CC. So probably it should be equal like just the G since I'm gonna be using GCC. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyways, um, if we do things like MK root shell and uh, specify the root point into output host root and modules uh, and this is going to be just the module directory if I'm not mistaken if I'm not mistaken I need to provide minus n here and well let's start by module name so for instance for instance, this. Well, I don't. Uh, I just want to start with this dynamic, which promises to install like glibc or something, but but it doesn't. Uh, yeah, let's kick start with this one. Generate module. Module. Okay. Oh, so here uh, I actually need to 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 provide the name dynamic. Um, and mm, I forgot how I did this. Oh, it's module. No, 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 no. Should be it's dynamic like this. Yeah, it doesn't print much, but anyways. So, um, if we just start, uh playing around with the script itself so here where it's about to be uh, dealing with this uh, with the modules so if we just echo and stage name which should be the name of the module itself so stage name yeah, it goes for dynamic, it just goes twice for it for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure if we do this, it just goes once. Yeah, probably, probably this this is enough. Uh, probably doesn't give this strain that I'm expecting for because maybe i I done this before recording the video, but anyways, maybe not. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, but uh, what I want to see here is, uh, is there a value for the cross compile? Um, and there is no value. So if I say uh, cross compile, I, I, I don't think this is going to be working. But anyway, it's G. So it depends G to CC to form the GCC. Um, our oh, module G cross compile. Uh, so yeah, I can do this like uh, he thinks this is the module. Uh, so maybe maybe it should be equals. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, um, even without this, so if we try to install this drop beer, for instance, and drop beer here, that indeed what he does, he actually invokes the script, um, he invokes the modules, here are the scripts, and he invokes this drop beer script. But again, again, so see, like this cross compile is like not being seen, or I don't know, and I don't know how to specify that. Um, so if I just do like specify this manual, I'm wondering is that 
So uh, all it does is is just um, so if I run this again, yeah, nothing happens. Um, so maybe I just I don't know is this gonna work um, or not? So I'll just like cross compile equals to G. I don't know. Uh, I really don't. So no idea. So here it will probably give an error. Does does it actually? This probably doesn't even get an error. Yeah, it doesn't even get there. So I don't know. Maybe if I just. So many drop beers. Let's just get rid of those. That sadly was a dependency, nothing special. Okay. Build a native um I did start building busy box from scratch. Why did he consider that? Well, definitely, there's something that shouldn't be happening for for the working sort of a distribution, even though even that, even that, even even if that's minimalist. But since they say like we provide a few modules but aren't interested in turning mk root into a linux distro so yeah what actually you expect from this and i've been thinking around with this for hours uh without much success really uh yeah i don't i have no idea even if he actually enters that script or not um but anyways, for some reason it doesn't compile it. And if you try to cheat and run this drop beer, then it just doesn't allow you doing this. Uh, saying you need to use the make root shell. And I have no idea how that even how on earth is that even possible. But just to give you an idea, so if you try to run module and drop beer. Oh yeah, you see, like <laughs> uh, this, this is what's what is telling me to use. But I'm wondering, is it gonna work if I um, mkroot shell minus n? Maybe it works if I. No, it doesn't. It still gives this weird error. So yeah, you know, like, when when. When the readme instruction doesn't match the reality, you know, like it's something that next to trying to maybe not write this from scratch, but uh, I don't know. You, you can't, it's not usable really. Uh, I believe this is a great piece of code, and yeah, Rob Landley is like a million times smarter than I am, but it's, it's really not usable. But uh, the reason why I decided to consider this exact, uh, this exact thing because it actually did provide a working uh, Linux for us that was built by running a single script and then just uh, you needed to manually uh, create this the virtual file system which again like in the script uh, in the version that, we, that it has been presented in uh, the embedded Linux conference he had that embedded but then for some reason he removed that line to create this virtual file system this uh, CPI OGZ image so I have no idea why that happened and also while well, obviously running the QEMU to like to bring together the kernel and um, and the file and then the root file system image together to or to boot the kernel that's obviously another terminal stuff but anyways so um, the real last thing even though I have no idea how how to make this kind of work but I don't even want to, and I don't need to, because I already know what would have, what would have happened if 
uh, if this worked. So if this worked, uh, what we can assume from somewhere this lines of code, so uh, he should be copying this to to the root bin uh, and then to probably to SSH, SSHD, and a lot of things. Probably I would be very surprised if he did that actually already, but I believe it didn't. Uh, so anything that looks like a drop beer, it's not there, not available. Um, some other folders, SSHD, SSH, it's not even exist or, or yeah, so hold on a sec, it's probably, this might be just a binary executable name instead, uh, which is more likely the case. No, it's not. So yeah, just something is broken there. Something doesn't work. But let's imagine. Let's imagine that it did. Com it did install this package. So literally, what would have happened then? It's something similar to what have been happening to the BusyBox itself. So it's been extracted. It's been compiled, and it's been installed uh, into this uh, root file system. Then, if we do this, uh, uh, if, you, if we create the CPIO GZ image again uh, and put it along with the kernel then in the kernel uh, that then in the emulator we'll have already some newly installed packages available for usage within that system uh, so that's the idea so what this means so this is something opposed to having a package manager system like uh, apt-get in debian based based systems like ubuntu or uh, or Linux means men that I'm currently using or Pac-Man in Arc Linux or whatever uh, so those package man manager systems are big big things uh, that do automatically track how the packages are installed in your system but what is supposed to be done here like everything is done by hands here is supposed to be done by hands so you can manually just download the package from somewhere, uh, you extract it, compile, and merge into the file system. Well, obviously you don't need to do this by hand, you can write some scripts to do this for you. But anyways, uh, even if you do this on, uh, completely on your own, and even if it works, uh, assuming the current uh, implementation, there are two uh, things to, to mention. So the first thing is that the BusyBox, in order to, to, to work, it's uh, uh, link statically uh, one of the videos before I said compile statically it's not accurate it's better it's more accurate to say link statically so that so that it doesn't use any shared libraries like glibc for instance um, it gives uh, a benefit of working just right out of the box strictly uh, like straight ahead the downside is that if you want to if you need to install some package that does have the dependency of glibc then you either, either need to install the glibc shared library or alternatively uh, you will try to install that package uh, statically being statically linked as well which one to consider it's it's up to you and like Rob Lindley said that if you have really lots of packages then it makes sense to install that shared library but if you have just a few and not going to update it anywhere uh, uh, anytime because that was all about the embedded link system which you just do it once and you're not going to be using this like you're going to be using the desktop version for instance so there it's not needed much so yeah that case you can just uh do all this static link pages for like for for uh static linked uh yeah uh, packages for for all for whatever package you're about to be installing and uh I just wanted to say to mention one more thing yeah one more thing that for instance uh if there are some miracle cures that you will try to uh on top of this system like the one we've built here if you try to somehow install uh dpackage package from package d package d d p k g package manager from debian which is the package management system uh like you might have think of this at the back end for the apt-get itself in this case 
all those packages that were not installed with this D package are not going to be treated as being installed, so it's not going to be seeing those. Uh, and again, uh, the matter of those dynamic shared libraries, like and all this, and you're just getting completely overwhelmed. And I just want to, uh, you know, like um, there are a lot of smart videos made by guys much smarter than I am who do things and it works great, but um no one explains uh this uh steps like where you're coming to the point when you're realizing why exactly the existing linux distributions are actually better than uh building things building everything from scratch on your own and it's not because it's difficult and it's not because you can't do it or you don't have enough skills like to program in bash shell well I don't, but it's, it's easy to pick up, it's easy to learn, it's, it's not that difficult. But the problem problem is not in programming itself, the, pro, the problem is, uh, uh, the problem uh, lies within the understanding of, you need uh, to, to bear in mind the entire overall, like, keep track of how the system is, the whole system is going to be working, and some possible potential, uh, like, things that can happen and or or may or may not happen like for instance uh let's say you have uh, a whole lot of packages statically linked this probably won't be possible for major uh, major amount of packages but anyway let's consider uh, let's assume that and then it happens that in the statically linked uh, library that you've linked statically there there, there, there was found some security vulnerability uh, vulnerability and in that case, this means that all the packages you have are vulnerable. Uh, well, if you don't care about this, that's just fine. But if you do, then uh, you need to uh, update <laughs> that st that shared library and uh, to recompile, to rebuild all the packages from scratch with this updated one. And in case if you have, uh, uh, if your packages are not static link and, and do use this shared library, you can just update the only library and then you don't need to uh, uh, update all uh, and recompile, rebuild all of the packages. So things like this, and this is just somewhat of the most simplest examples possible, basically. So from this point, uh, ju just to end this talk a little bit, at this point we're coming to a need, an understanding, the need of um, exploring some existing either build scripts or maybe some tiny Linux dis distributions that already take decisions on um, this variety of problems that you, you, you just don't even, you're not even aware of they exist, those problems, uh, until you face them when, when you're trying to build this on your own. So, like learning from those existing implementations at very least helps you to kind of build the path like uh, understanding like which approaches it can be developing because it, it grows really exponentially because there are so many opportunities to make uh, things uh, to make one thing in a whole lot of many different ways and every every single way has own has own uh, has its own pros and cons and depending on your goals uh, you're the one to consider which one to to pick up and it's a trade-off between the size, uh, resource usage, well, not really that much of resource usage, but not general, let's say, the size of the distribution. So the more generic, distribu this, uh, the more generic distribution is, the more space it takes. The more automated uh, distribution is, so let's say you don't need to manually download and install the packages but instead you can just use the package manager, for instance. In this case, it also it complicates the entire system because the system, the Linux system that does have a package manager and, then that, and the one that does not, one of the like, biggest differences, so the one that does not have the package management system, uh, the matter of updating the packages is all, is all on you. So you, you need to invent 
how exactly you're going to be updating that packages. And bear in mind the fact that the packages are, uh, may also have dependencies and you need to resolve the dependencies as well. So it may happen that you update the package, but you didn't update the dependencies and the package is not working. So you also need to make sure that you update all of the dependencies. So that's all the work that package managers are doing for you. But again, like if you don't do much, if you don't use much, this might be on the cards as well. So um, let's probably start at this point. Uh, and in the next videos, I'll keep exploring this uh, early stages of, build, of, build, of building the Linux system and we'll see, uh, we'll probably start looking at some existing distributions, uh, trying to either, either build them from scratch or at least run and see how they are different, what, can you, or what you can do within those distributions. And that's the way to actually uh, <laughs> to figure out that the Linux Mint is the best distribution <laughs> in the world for all times. Yeah, so that's that's the thought that is coming to my mind. <laughs> the more I explore this, and the more I understand, understand that the current Linux distribution I'm using is actually <laughs> the best ever. Well, this is for my needs. Okay, guys, so this is it from my side. Thanks for watching. Until next time, and take care.